Right. So in the next of this section, uh, we will discuss four propositions. I will call it propositions, but basically it's a mixture of four mostly obvious statements which we can derive and write down from what we have discussed in the past lectures. And I will also put in some definitions of, um, let's say, quite obvious quantities, but which will be useful for the general setup of the proof. I will always denote uh, or fix a graph G, which is one particle irreducible, because that's sufficient for discussing renormalization. The sector is fixed, uh, C and sigma. And in the integrals that we encounter, uh, we will always keep this I epsilon prescription, and uh, epsilon is bigger than zero, it is fixed. And actually, to make the notation a little bit simpler, you know that we always the combination M square minus I epsilon appears Therefore, it is natural to simply absorb the I epsilon into the M square, and then M square always has a small um, non-vanishing imaginary part, which is negative imaginary. Then the notation is simpler, but we can always restore the I epsilon because we keep the mass dependence explicit. Right, so four propositions. Let us begin with the first one. 353, three. proposition A on subgraph structure This is essentially what we have just seen in the example but uh, made systematic and written down with some definitions for the general case. So as we have seen and as it is obvious, we can always order the subgraphs according to the T operations. So and to make it obvious, we can enumerate them such that our um, set C has the following entries with the names H1, H2, up to HL. L is the number of loops, and uh, that makes use of the fact that we know the number of elements is always equal to the number of loops. And the biggest element is also always equal to the full graph G. But we can define such an enumeration, and then the property is that if one graph Hi is a subgraph of another one Hj in this set, then it appears before. So in other words, I must be smaller than J. This is the only criterion for the enumeration, and this is, of course, possible. Um, and then the product, uh, which one would call product of all subgraphs in this set of th, uh, or 1 minus th, is now defined, because these operations do not commute, um, it is defined as this order, namely hl comes last and h1 comes first. And then this is a correct ordering. So what we have done here is to define an enumeration. It is always possible. And uh, then we can rely that uh, in this enumeration, the ordering is correct. Then the next thing is, uh, as in our example, let us imagine we have treated the subgraphs up to a certain point. So fix H, or in other words, HI, with a certain index I in this set. Then we imagine to write down all these operations, HL, then here there is HI, here there is H1. And we treat them step by step up to here, and then we stop and see what has happened. And afterwards, we would go on. So we define now what is the structure of the graphs that have been treated before we arrive at our particular subgraph H. Okay. 
right? And uh, we have this enumeration, but I always, uh, if it is possible, like to write down the equations in a way which does not make use of the enumeration. We can always refer to it, but if we can write down the equation without using uh, the enumeration, that would be nicer. So the structure of all graphs before H is a certain set of graphs. Let us call this set capital X prime. X, would, X without prime would contain the next graph H and with, with prime it's the set of graphs before H. This is the set and using the enumeration it is the set H1 up to Hi minus 1. So this is the set. But what is the structure of the set? We have already seen it in the example. First of all, the set um, in the previous example, it was the set of all graphs before H5. And this set can be decomposed into two parts. Namely, the graphs which are subgraphs of our particular chosen one in the previous example, H5 is the graph we want to do next. And the subgraphs were H4, H2, H3, but uh, the H1 was not a subgraph. So here we can also write it, uh, decompose it as all H prime in C, which are subgraphs of H, but different from H. They must all be uh, treated before, because a subgraph of H cannot be treated after H. Therefore, every graph which is a subgraph of H in the forest, of course, must be treated before. So it must be part of this set of treated graphs. And then there are some disjoint graphs as well. In the previous example, it was this H1, the right vacuum bubble or one loop bubble. Uh, so some disjoint graphs and they have no particular structure. Okay. And so let's give it a name. So this uh, set of all the graphs which are subgraphs of H, which must all be part of X prime. Let's call them X prime H. And uh, this is another set. Let's give it a name X prime. And uh, the name I invented is H strike through notation. Okay, so this is some set of graphs in X prime, which is not a subgraph of H. Now, looking even in more detail at this, this is a set of graphs. Every graph in this set is a subgraph of H. On, and of course, it is a subset of a forest. It is a subset of a forest for the big graph G. But as a subset of a forest, any subset of a forest is always a forest. And in this case, uh, it is a forest of the graph H because every graph here is a subgraph of H. So a forest is a set of disjoint or nested graphs and uh, subsets are still disjoint or nested. That means this set here is a one forest of H. And it is a forest which does not contain H itself. So it's what we called normal forest of H. So this could be interesting to know. Okay. So that is the structure of graphs treated before we arrive at our graph H. Now in the example, we saw that it is also interesting that uh, this set contains maximal graphs, the biggest graphs in all these chains of nested subgraphs. So let's give that a name. in X prime, and let's call this X zero prime. These are the maximal elements. Now, what is the structure of the maximal elements? The maximal elements can be again uh, decomposed into those ones which are subgraphs of H and the other ones which are disjoint from H. So let's say 
small m1 to small ms. These would be subgraphs, maximal subgraphs of uh, H. And this set by itself is also interesting. We have already made use of it in our example when we had the table and we always defined this h bar, h3 bar, h4 bar, h5 bar, which was the reduction with respect to the maximal subgraphs. Here we have the maximal subgraph, so this is uh, apparently an important set of graphs. So let's give it a name. Let's call it curly m of h. This is the set of the maximal subgraphs of h, of course specific to the forest C. So this is one part of the maximal elements of our set X prime, and the other part is disjoint. Let's call it capital M1 up to capital M capital S. And these are simply disjoint maximal subgraphs. Okay, so this is the structure of the maximal subgraphs, and in particular, uh, part of it is this set of maximal subgraphs of H, specific to our forest, which is called curly M of H. And now, like in our example, let's do the next step. Let's say treat also this renormalization one minus T of H, or HI in this notation here. What happens? Then our sets change, of course. So the set of treated graphs is now enlarged by our new graph H. So the set of treated graphs, and this is now what we call X without prime. So X without prime, uh, capital X, don't mind uh, this uh, notation. Sometimes I do it just to highlight that it's a capital X. So the treated graphs are now the previous X prime joined with the new graph H, of course. So this is just one additional subgraph. And what about the maximal elements? So the set of maximal treated graphs, X zero without prime, that has changed in the following way. So now if you add the graph H, the graph H is disjoint from all those ones, but it contains all of these. So the maximal graphs are now H replaces all of those, but it has nothing to do with them. Therefore, the set of maximal graphs is now H instead of all of them, and uh, the others remain. Okay, so there is a jump if you want in the set of treated maximal graphs. So this all gets joined into one. And by the way, I mean, uh, it can be that um, uh, there are no such maximal subgraphs. If this H is a one loop graph, then it has no subgraphs and then this set is empty. This is also possible. So it, this can be an empty set um, or it can be a set with one element, like in our case of the subgraph H3, which was this graph. If we add the graph H3, then it has precisely one subgraph and it just enlarges this one subgraph. But in the case of H5, previously we had this structure, then we add H5 and we join these two maximal subgraphs to one graph. So all things can happen. This can be an empty set. It can contain one element which is enlarged or it can contain several elements which are joined into one new graph H. So this is the structure of what can happen. And as in our example now, what are the new features after adding the graph H? So the graph H brings in some new lines which are only in H and which were not treated before. And these essential new lines are the ones which are contained in this reduced graph. So let's define this. I would call it the essential new part. The essential new part is what we defined before H 
bar, which is the new graph H, but divided by all its maximal subgraphs. So this is really uh, everything which uh, appears here is new. All the lines which appear in this reduced graph have never been treated before in none of the previous graphs. Therefore, this is the essential new feature. And in our example of this H5, it was this. This is our example of H5 bar, where all of the previously treated graphs are reduced to points. So here a four-loop counter term, here a one-loop counter term. And this is the essential new feature which comes into play once we treat also H5. So this is this operation here. So it contains a certain set of new lines. And how many additional loops does it bring in? It brings always in precisely one additional loop. That is clear because our forest C contains for each loop exactly one unique subgraph. That was the construction that we did in our lemma three at the time. So therefore, all these reduced graphs are always one loop graphs, like in this example here. So all of this is obvious. Then uh, the last remark on subgraph aware momenta. This was property J in our section three, four, one. So we can always define what we call Q underscore, a unique set of momenta, which can be decomposed into Q H one bar, Q H two uh, underscore, and so on, up to Q H L underscore, um, or another word for, yeah, would be the same as QG underscore, because G is the same as HL. So all these um, momenta span all momenta of the graph. And each QHI underscore contains only momenta for the reduced graph HI bar. So this does not contain momenta of the full graph HI, but only of the reduced graph HI bar, uh, which corresponds exactly to our examples. Then also the use, the set of all use can also be decomposed into this H1. But here it's more obvious where each of them uh, contains only lines. Of HI bar. And all the lines of any graph are uniquely decomposed into the lines of these H bar subgraphs. And the same can be done for the masses in our Feynman diagram. M can also be decomposed into MH1, MHL. So these are all subsets of mass variables for the graph. And each mass variable corresponds to the lines in the appropriate reduced subgraph. So for the lines, it's more obvious than for the vertices, but for the vertices, we have this property J, which guarantees that this is possible. And for the lines, each line has a U and an M variable. It is obvious. Okay, so this is our first proposition on the subgraph structure and uh, the decomposition of important variables that we need in our integral description. Okay, let us continue with our propositions or collections of more or less obvious but important general statements. From our example, we can also draw this conclusion. We have in general 
sector variables consisting of T and betas. And here I already wrote down the essential thing, namely for each subgraph in our uh, maximal forest, there are as many as there are loops, there is one T variable. We can call them TH for each H in this set C, or we can call them T1 up to TL as we like. Then we have seen in the example that the alphas have a certain parametrization in terms of t's and betas, and let us now write this down. The labeled alphas are treated in a special way because they are directly given in terms of t's. And so if you have one subgraph h, then there is one line which is the labeled one, sigma of h. And then for this particular line, the alpha k is given by this th square times some other t's, namely times all t's for the subgraphs h prime, which have the property h prime is also in this uh, maximal forest, and h prime contains but is not equal to our chosen subgraph h. So this is uh, the other t's that have op uh, also appeared in our example. And so in the example, we have already abbreviated this as Psi H, so this product here of all the other T's, we will now refer to as Psi H square, and uh, there is always an unambiguous uh, value for this. It can be one, or it can be uh, a product of several, or just of one single other T. Then uh, all the lines in the graph are either labeled or not labeled, and the not labeled are also given in terms of the betas. And as we already saw, the graph is uniquely uh, partitioned into these h bar subgraphs. So each h bar uh, is the unique set of the new lines brought in by this graph h, reduced with respect to all its maximal subgraphs. And then if we have one line in this uh, part of the graph h bar, then the t's it contains are exactly th these ones. And, uh, the labeled one is just given by this, and the non-labeled ones are given by this expression times a corresponding beta. So we can say that for all uh, lines in this h bar, alpha k is given by the same as here, th square times psi h square uh, times beta k. And then in the case of labeled ones, beta sigma of h is just uh, defined to be one, so this variable doesn't really exist. But uh, to have a uniform way to write it, I will just say beta k every time. And some of the betas, the labeled ones, are fixed to one. And the other ones are really free variables uh, which need to be integrated over. So this is the way we can do it. And uh, that is not surprising. Now, uh, let me also collect our result from our section 331 on semantic polynomials and the integration measure. So just to record this also once again, this is not new, but the integral over one sector of all the alphas, so with these inequalities that define the specific chosen sector, of the semantic polynomial UG for the full graph to the power minus d over 2, this can be written as follows. So first of all, the integration measure transforms, and we obtain uh, the integral over all the t's. So product of all the t's, 1 to l, d, t, i. And uh, then the sector is defined by t, l, going from 0 to infinity. All the other t, i's, which are different from l, but let me not write it down explicitly, they go from 0 to 1. And all the betas also go from 0 to 1. That defines the sector. And then we have this integration measure. And for each ti, we get uh, the following factor. We get ti to the power uh, 2 times the number of lines in the corresponding subgraph, hi, minus 1. And then uh, from the semantic polynomial, we get plus d times the number of loops in the subgraph hi, sorry, with a minus, right? 
So this is what we obtained from the measure and from the semantic polynomial transformation. And uh, then we also obtain two to the power, um, excuse me, two to the power of uh, loops in the full graph. Uh, right, because for each t we get a factor of two. Then what remains is the semantic polynomial remainder d tilde of g to the power minus d over two. And let us just record once again what we know about this d tilde g because it arises by factoring out all the t's from the semantic polynomial, which was a homogeneous polynomial in all the alphas, with the degree being equal to the number of loops in the full graph. So we can factor out all the t's with uh, these powers here. And what remains is a polynomial still of the remaining variables. And this polynomial is bounded. It is bigger or equal than one. Cannot become smaller than one in the integration range because it is a positive sum of monomials with positive coefficients. And uh, so if all the variables are positive, this can only be bigger or equal than one. And it is independent of the overall Tg for the full graph because uh, every alpha contains Tg to the same power. Therefore, this can be completely factored out and it only appears here, but not in this d tilde g anymore. And it is a polynomial in all the other ones. In all the other ti's where i is smaller, smaller than l, and in all the betas. And if all of them go to zero, then this uh, would at most go to one, but not to zero or to something smaller than one. This is what we know. Okay, and this uh, variable set is the one we use in our integration, of course. And this transformation of the measure and the semantic polynomial is also an important ingredient in our calculation. That is proposition B, collection of old results and uh, some new definitions of the variable xi for each subgraph. Now we can go to the next step. And the next step is already written here, proposition C, namely the integral representation of our graph. And here I just wanted to write down in a nice form how does our result and our integral look like when we plug in everything that we have done. We plug in the variables and we plug in uh, everything else that we know. I will prove it in a few minutes, but let us explain the result. Um, and it should not be too surprising. So first of all, any loop integral uh, in the appropriate sector can be written down in the following way. For each loop, we get this prefactor CD, which we will talk about later. We get two for each loop from over there, from the measure transformation. Then we have exactly what I told you just now. For each T variable, we have this uh, T integration and we have T to this power two times the number of lines minus d times the number of loops in the appropriate subgraph minus one. And now there appears a new thing, namely RHI. And RHI is the degree of the numerator. So now we allow really seriously in general that the Feynman graph has an arbitrary numerator. And the numerator must be a product of lines and vertices. I didn't write it. But what I mean by a product of line and vertex is that uh, for each line, we get a factor of uh, objects in the numerator which only depend on the line itself, mass um, and momentum of the line. For each vertex, uh, which is located somewhere in the graph, we only get factors uh, of properties that the vertex knows about, which are the external momenta of this particular vertex or other properties specific to the vertex. So that is uh, the numerator that we allow. Then the numerator of each subgraph has a certain degree with respect to power counting, and that we call RHI. And this appears here in the exponent as well. This is the integration range. We integrate over the t's and the betas. And then for the numerator, we get this object z tilde g. We will talk about it later, and we get uh, the d tilde as before and e to the iwg 
as you know, from our explicit calculations and from general considerations. So the power counting degree of each subgraph is then given by d0, the physical dimension, times the number of loops, minus 2 times the number of lines, plus um, the numerator degree. This is the new object. And uh, so the appearance of this is in particular what we need to derive now because everything else is already kind of clear. Now, uh, the second part of the blackboard is also extremely important. Namely, what are the variables we can express all of these functions in terms of? The variables are, first of all, uh, all the external momenta, the masses, and the U variables of the graph. Remember, we can choose without loss of generality, subgraph-aware variables. So we partition all our external momenta into external momenta of each time this reduced graph h over the maximal subgraphs. So this is uh, the external momenta of this unique set of lines specific to this subgraph h. Likewise, the unique lines in h define masses, the unique lines in h define new variables. So. Now we rescale, and the rescaling is done according to the t variables of the corresponding subgraph. So for each subgraph, there is this unique t plus uh, or times all the other t's, and we rescale by this, and we rescale to the power 1 instead of square like for the alphas. So we rescale in this way for the momentum, and we rescale in this way for the masses, and we rescale in the reverse way for the u's then the dimensionality of all these variables is the same. Now, um, the uh, variables that we obt obtain after rescaling are denoted with a tilde, so tilde always denotes such a rescaling. And I want to say immediately, this rescaling will change, as we have seen in the example, if we treat step by step the renormalization of the subgraphs. Each time we integrate over one t variable because we integrate out one sub-renormalized graph, then this t variable is lost and then we will change the rescaling. But for now, we have not renormalized anything. This is the regularized expression for the original graph in dimensional regularization. And then this is the starting rescaling with all the t's that we have defined in our subgraph. So, this is the set of variables. Then our numerator, this is the claim, can be expressed as follows. So we, uh, it is first of all a product of lines and vertices in momentum space. Then the momenta can be uh, treated in terms of derivatives with respect to u variables. And now we can write it in such a way that this becomes a product of uh, zh's where for each uh, of these reduced subgraphs h bar, we have one factor z tilde h. And then this z tilde h for each reduced subgraph depends only on the variables for this particular subgraph, namely these variables here. So derivatives with respect to the rescaled use for the subgraph, rescaled masses, and rescaled external momenta specific to this uh, reduced graph h. So this is a possible way to write the numerator, as we claim. And then uh, the rest is uh, this usual object here that we always had in examples. And now uh, we say this is an analytic function in epsilon. This is obvious because epsilon only appears here, and this is in the exponent, so it's just an exponential. It's, of course, analytic. It is infinitely differentiable in all the variables of uh, physics interest, so the loop integrations and uh, these rescaled variables. And now, by the way, um, you see that, uh, just as a reminder, originally, um, u's appeared in this form also in examples, u over t. This is what appeared in example calculation. So if we express everything in terms of u's, then we have u over t, and this is not infinitely differentiable uh, in, in t um, if t goes to zero. However, if we replace this by u tilde, then there is no 1 over t anymore. And as a function of u tilde separately and t separately, this is infinitely differentiable. So this is nice. So the claim is this is infinitely differentiable in all these variables 
including the rescaling. And of course, it's exponentially decreasing if the T overall goes to infinity because of the plus I epsilon prescription. Right, so this is the claim. And what we need to establish in particular is the numerator structure and the appearance of this RH and the fact that we can express everything in terms of these rescaled variables. So I cleaned the blackboard. This is our statement that we want to prove quickly. And uh, in order to prove it, we need to begin uh, with the actual definition because I wrote here the result for an integral, but I didn't actually uh, give you the starting definition of what the integral should be. It's kind of obvious, but let us nevertheless uh, write it down. So in general, the proof will consist of four parts, A, B, C, D. Um, and the starting point is this. Our graph G is actually given by what I will call C, D prime to the power of loops. Then loop integrations K1 up to KL for each loop. Then we have some numerator, which has the properties that I explained before some uh, d1 up to di for each internal line. And let us also include i to the power uh, of the number of internal lines, which is the normal uh, i divided by d for each propagator in quantum field theory. And uh, this here is an arbitrary normalization. Um, which should satisfy C um, D0 in the physical dimension prime is equal to 1. And what we always did here and what we will continue to do is C D prime is equal to mu uh, to the power of D0 minus D. Okay? Then at D0, this is just 1. But in general, we have a mu dependence here. And for each loop, we typically introduce such a mu factor. But in fact, uh, one could also do something more general. But this is what we will assume. So if that is our starting point, then we can just read off from our section 342, which was the general alpha parametrization, including um, u variables for arbitrary numerators that we obtain. Now a new factor of CD without prime to the power L, which is given by uh, whatever we started with, CD prime times another factor which always appears, I to the 1 minus D over 2 times 4 pi to the power minus D over 2. So this is not 1 in the physical dimension, but it is some loop factor like 1 over 16 pi squared times I, which appears for every loop. And uh, that combination is what we also previously abbreviated as uh, CD. Okay, so this is the first factor that appears in the result, and uh, then it goes on. We obtain the general alpha integration, alpha 1 up to alpha i for each internal line, times a factor CG without tilde. This contains derivatives with respect to u. And uh, then the semantic polynomial before rescaling, ug to the power minus d over 2 times e to the i wg. And all of that is evaluated at u equals 0. So that is, that is all. That is the structure. So we have semantic polynomial and exponential of w times some derivatives with respect to u or other numerator factors. And at the end, after taking the derivatives, we set u to 0, and then we do the integration. That's the result. And now uh, the claim is that it can be brought into this form. And this is kind of obvious, but let us just do the steps. Let us begin uh, with a numerator factor, since that is new. So at first, this set g contains 
all variables that can appear in a numerator in Feynman diagrams, external momenta, can be uh, brought into this unambiguous set U Q. Uh, then masses for all lines and uh, derivatives with respect to all U variables for all lines. Now, we can already uh, make use of some rearrangements. As I said, at each vertex, um, we know each vertex belongs to one unique reduced subgraph H bar because they uh, span the full graph. And uh, then we can use momentum conservation to uh, express all momenta this vertex needs in the numerator factor to express them as the internal momenta of this graph here the vertex is attached to. we can express the vertex uh, momenta. All vertex momenta can be written as the external momenta of that subgraph where, where the vertex is part of and the internal line momenta of that uh, graph. How is this? Which is d by d u h. So what we do not need is we do not need to take uh, derivatives with respect to u's which are outside of that subgraph. That is the special feature. So we can have external momenta with explicit q's or derivatives with respect to internal lines of this h bar, but the external momenta uh, flowing into this graph which would need u derivatives with respect to other lines outside of this, they can be uh, absorbed into that by using momentum conservation. And that explains why uh, we can write the set Q, all the products of um, all um, vertex factors and line factors for propagators in the numerator can be expressed in a product uh, where each factor in the product corresponds to precisely one H bar and contains only these variables. So we can get such a CH with the announced dependence. But we have not yet discussed the rescaling. But up to the rescaling, we have uh, now determined exactly this um, behavior. So, and it is also clear that um, this numerator is a polynomial in all variables and uh, in particular then also each individual set H for each subgraph is a polynomial in these variables. So, polynomial in the external momenta, polynomial in U derivatives for internal lines of the subgraph and polynomial in the masses of the subgraph. And the degree of the polynomial is given by dimensionality. Um, let's call it R H bar. This is the degree of the polynomial specific to this set H factor, which contains only the quantities for the uh, reduced graph H bar. This is not the same as the degree in the numerator of the full subgraph H without uh, reducing the maximal subgraphs. But the relationship is the full numerator of the full graph is now given by the sum over uh, all these R H bars, let's say H bar prime, over all subgraphs of this uh, big graph H. So H prime is a subgraph or equal 
to the full graph H, and then we sum over all these H bar primes and obtain the numerator degree of the full graph. Good. That was our second step, and now the third step is the one that you know best, certainly, namely our explicit calculations with a general formalism with U and uh, E to the IW and so on, where we introduce the curly M. So that can now be made use of. This was in section 343 and 341. Um, property K, uh, as we noted it there, gives rise to the following structure. So our graph here is defined or described by a matrix curly M. And the matrix curly M is this block matrix, 0, minus 2, small b, minus 2, small b transpose, minus 4 alpha, where this is the reduced incidence matrix for the full graph, and this is the matrix of alphas put into the diagonal. And then we need for the description capital Q, which is now a subgraph aware, QH1 underscore all the Qs up to QHL underscore, then all the Us, UH1 up to UHL. This is the full set of variables, uh, just a direct generalization of our calculation. And the reduced incidence matrix has the following block structure. It has here BH1 which is the reduced incidence matrix for the subgraph H1. Then here in the diagonal, it has the reduced incidence matrix for the graph H2 bar, which is uh, the new graph um, which we obtain after treating H1. Maybe reduced, maybe not reduced, um, depending on the details. And here we have a zero. Then here we have BH3 bar and so on. Here we have B, H, L bar. And here we always have zeros below the diagonal. But above the diagonal, we do not necessarily have zeros, but we have those objects. So let me call them B, H, I bar, H, J bar, which only exist if uh, H, I is a subgraph of HJ. So these sit here in the upper uh, triangle of the reduced incidence matrix, and they only exist if uh, one graph is a subgraph of the other one, as we had in our example. In our example, we did it exactly for two graphs, namely H and G. H was a subgraph of G, and then we had here BHG. H was a subgraph of G, and then we had here such an um, off-diagonal block. And now there are many such off-diagonal blocks, all have the similar structure as in our example, uh, but there are many of them. And uh, so some blocks might be zero, namely blocks uh, corresponding to two disjoint graphs. They are just zero, but blocks of nested graphs, uh, they might be non-zero. So that is the structure of the reduced incidence matrix. And then in terms of all this, our WG is of course given as uh, usual as Q transpose times M to the minus one times Q. That's it, uh, no that's not it, minus K prime. And K prime is the sum over all the masses and K square times alpha K. And remember that I simply absorbed the plus I epsilon into the masses here to make the notation simpler. Good, then this is uh, the setup of our graph. And now, um, let me delete the left half of the blackboard instead of the upper blackboard so that we can always uh, refer to what we want to prove. Shouldn't take too long. We just need to go on a little bit and uh, combine some details.
So what we uh, did in our explicit calculation in section 3.4 was to reorder here the Qs and the Us to make this block structure even nicer. That we did uh, in order to make really apparent and really crystal clear uh, what happens in terms of physics. Uh, but now we understand what happens in terms of physics, so we don't need this reordering. We just uh, use the matrix in the form as we have it here. So we don't reorder. But what we keep doing is we keep the rescaling. And the rescaling is now more complicated than in our example. In the example, we also had a matrix, capital T, or capital T to the minus one, which rescaled all the entries of the matrix to give us our curly M tilde. That was important, and now we do that here as well, and the direct generalization of what we did in the example is this, that we rescale each time with the appropriate T's, but now we have here TH1 times Xi of H1. Uh, that gives us all these additional T's that we need for the correct rescaling. So the Q's are rescaled by T, and uh, then TH2, Xi H2, and so on. And then the U's are rescaled with the inverse. Um, so at some point here there is TH1, Xi H1, so the minus one, this corresponds to the first U, and then the last entry is THL, Xi HL to the minus one. And these are all block matrices, and the number of lines and columns in these blocks corresponds to the number of lines uh, or vertices in these reduced graphs H1, H2, and so on. So this is our rescaling matrix, and then we can again define M tilde, M curly tilde is given by T to the minus one times the original M times T to the minus one. And now, what is the structure of the resulting matrix? So the structure of the resulting matrix is the following. So M has a zero block here, of course. So here the zero remains. And uh, the alpha block gets rescaled by uh, this twice because we multiply from the rest and from the right, and that means that each alpha is simply transformed to the corresponding beta. So in this block, we get only betas and ones, namely the labeled lines become one, and the non-labeled lines become just beta. And this does not contain any T anymore, it only contains betas and ones and only on the diagonal, so that the product is a product of betas and ones. So, here we have a zero block. Here we have the same as here, only transposed. And what do we have here in the upper block? In the upper block, we have, let me simply do a shorthand notation, BIJ. Uh, BIJ corresponds to all of these um, blocks. So we have two indices in general. If i is um, bigger than j, then we are here in the lower diagonal, then we get zero. If i is equal to j, then we get uh, the diagonal. And what is the rescaling of the diagonal b entries? The diagonal b entries get once rescaled with this and once rescaled with the inverse. So they don't get rescaled at all. Then we have here in the upper entries, i is smaller than j, some non-zero entries, and they get rescaled. They get rescaled from the left with this here, without the inverse. So they get rescaled by t h i times xi xi h i from the left. And from the right, they get rescaled with an inverse, but with index j. Okay. So this is exactly the general rescaling. Some of them are zero, but uh, the non-zero ones get exactly this rescaling. And uh, now, what is the point here? The point is that the off-diagonal blocks get rescaled by what? 
So the off-diagonal blocks always involve i smaller than j. So if i is smaller than j and hi is a subgraph of hj, then uh, this product of t's for the subgraph hi contains fewer factors than the t's for the subgraph hj. So hi is a subgraph not equal to hj. That means if you look at the t variables, then this contains a certain set of t variables, and this contains the same time sum extra t's. Therefore, in this fraction, all these t's from here cancel, and what remains are the extra t's from this subgraph, and they appear only in the numerator. That means this fraction here is not really a fraction at all, but it's a polynomial. It's a polynomial of the remaining t's from this uh, subgraph hi. So it's a polynomial. No uh, fraction. That is important, and that is part of the reason why we get these functions which are C infinity. So a polynomial is a C infinity function, differentiable and continuous, because these denominators here have now just cancelled. That is important. Okay, so that we know. And therefore, overall, if we look at the M tilde, Defined in this way, the M tilde contains 0, beta, and 1, and t's in the numerator. And the b's are, of course, incidence matrices, so they are just uh, 1's and zeros as well. Therefore, M overall, M tilde, is a polynomial in all these variables. So or each matrix entry is a polynomial. in all t's and beta's. Is it also invertible? What about the inverse? Because we know in the end uh, the inverse appears in our uh, Feynman diagram calculation. Is the inverse also a C infinity function? Well, the inverse uh, exists because the determinant of this is non-zero. What is the determinant of um, m tilde? The determinant of m tilde up to a factor, uh, a fixed factor, which is not dependent on anything. It was minus four times the number of lines, or to the power of number of lines. Uh, this is proportional to our uh, semantic polynomial d tilde t. And about that, we knew that this was a polynomial and bigger or equal than one. Therefore, the determinant can never be zero. It's actually uh, separated from zero by a constant value, and therefore the inverse of m tilde exists, and it is also continuous, and since it's the inverse of a polynomial, it's a C-infinity function. That means even m tilde to the minus one is C-infinity in all these variables. Uh, and maybe I should add in the integration region. Because um, the integration variables are zero or positive, um, and uh, this determinant here is bigger or equal than one if the integration variables are zero or positive. For negative values, uh, this could become zero. Um, but uh, in the integration region, um, we have this property. Therefore, our WG, if we look at this definition now, can be written in the following way. Q transpose times t to the minus 1 times m tilde to the minus 1 times t to the minus 1 and times Q. So this is an identity. So going back to m to the minus 1 is then uh, given by this as well. Now we have determined that m tilde to the minus 1 is C infinity in all variables. Which variables? T's and beta's. Now, what about this? We can factor the product in this way. If we combine the factors in this way, then what uh, do we obtain? We obtain that this product here is a product of this precise matrix here times that column vector. That means uh, this product contains precisely the tilde variables. Q is always multiplied with T 
to the appropriate uh, power. So this depends only on Q tilde instead of Q. So in, in, in a simple word, this T to the minus one just transforms all the Qs and Us into Q tilde and U tilde. So let me write this in blue here. This contains only Q tilde and U tilde. There is no trace anymore from T and no trace anymore from Q alone or U alone. It only depends on these precise combinations. Now what about the rest? The rest is of course uh, even easier. So this is now a sum over all variables. The alphas get replaced by T's and betas. And then of course each mass in each subgraph is multiplied with the appropriate set of T's to make out of it the M tilde. So we can write it in this way. Uh, obviously, sum over all the subgraphs H, and then sum over all the lines in the appropriate H bar, which uh, this covers the full set of all lines. And then we simply have the appropriate beta K times the appropriate M tilde K square. And uh, that shows that also this part only depends on betas and m tilde variables. And of course, this is a product. Therefore, uh, this wg is a C infinity function in all the variables, uh, namely in the t's and betas, and the m tilde, q tilde, and u tilde. That's it. Now we have proved this part of the statement. So we have proved it for W. Obviously, it also holds for E to the IW. And even more obviously, it anyway holds for this, because we know this already from before. So now we know this as well. And now the only thing that remains is to go from this um, numerators set without tilde to the rescaled set. This is now just a, inserting the same replacement. And this will also generate the R sub H in um, the prefactor of the integral here. So let's do this. So let's just do it quickly. So this is not very deep. And uh, so we just need to rescale our set H. So what we knew from the previous discussion about our ZH is that it was a polynomial of a certain degree in the derivatives with respect to U and the Qs and the Ms respect for the respective uh, graph H bar. Now we write it in the following way. So this is ZH. And uh, let me insert here something. But previously, it was a function of D by the UH qh underscore and mh. Now, each of these variables has been rescaled just now. And so we can write it as a function of the rescaled objects, th times xi h times du tilde, uh, sorry, to the minus 1, times du tilde, q tilde, and m tilde. So that is just an identity. So now it depends on all of these rescaled variables, but uh, the rescaled variables must be multiplied with this factor. And now we know that this is, of course, a polynomial in all of these of a homogeneous degree. So each factor or each term in the sum contains the same number of factors. And the number of factors is degree r h bar. And uh, therefore, we can factor out as many of these prefactors, th psi h to the power minus r h bar times z h. And this now only contains uh, these new variables, d by du tilde h, q tilde h, and m tilde h. And uh, that is what we called z tilde h. And this has the announced structure. It is still a polynomial in with uh, the appropriate degree. But it depends only on those rescaled variables, as we announced here. And so we can 
uh, bring our numerator into a form which is just the product of those z tilde h's. And then we obtain this additional prefactor, and that additional prefactor should combine to what we claimed over there. So let's, um, we do this for each subgraph. So we, in the full expression, we have a product of these expressions, product over all h's. So that means the product over all h's of these set h factors gives us product over all h's of the z h tildes. This is what we already like. And then we have an additional product of these rescaling prefactors, product over all h's. And each factor in the product is the following. th times xi h, but now let's insert the value of xi h. The xi h is the product over all h prime graphs, which are bigger and not equal than the full graph, uh, than the subgraph h. And you multiply all these th primes. So this is a double product. And all of this is taken to the power r h bar. Okay. So I hope there are not too many indices. There is h, a particular subgraph. That is the reduced version of it. And these are bigger graphs, h prime which we have to multiply over. So we just need to rearrange this double product. So let me do it on the blackboard. So writing is maybe um, weirder. This th can be brought into the product by making an equal sign. So if we allow here not unequal, but also equal, then this is just part of the product. So this was an identity what I just did. So we have now simplified it. Then we have a direct double product, double product over two graphs, h and h prime, and now they appear on an equal footing. Two graphs, h and h prime. One is a subgraph of the other one. And we multiply over all th primes, and we exponentiate with r h bar. OK. That can be certainly written in a more clever way. And the more clever way is the following. So these two products are now basically independent. We can also say we do first the product over all h primes, and then we multiply with all h's, which are subgraphs thereof. But here, first of all, we have th prime. This does actually not depend on the chosen subgraph h. And therefore, we can just bring this into the exponent. Here we have then exponent of minus the sum over all subgraphs h, which are subgraphs or equal to h prime, and we sum over all r h bars. Now, and this is exactly the sum that we had somewhere before. Maybe it's still on the blackboard. Uh, maybe not. But anyway, this sum here over all the r h bars is exactly the same as the r for the h prime subgraph. So this is equal to th bar to the power minus r h prime. You can now rename it back to h if you want. But anyway, we have proven that precisely this factor ti to the power minus r h i appears. And with this, we have proven completely our expression. So this ends the proof of our proposition C. We can express our loop integrals in this form. A loop prefactor for any loop, product of all t integrations and beta integrations. And the very nice feature is that in the exponent of each t, exactly the power counting degree of the respective subgraph appears, including the numerator. This is what has happened here. So this is now very nice. So each t is exponentiated with the power counting of the respective subgraph, including numerators. And uh, the second line contains the beta integration and an integrand. And this part of the integrand essentially consists only of the rescaled variables. And it's a C-infinity function in all the rescaled variables. This is our starting point for 
the loop integrations. Now we just want to do one final proposition, uh, collecting previous results and bringing them into a form which is optimally adapted to um, carrying out the inductive proof for renormalization. And uh, that is what I will call proposition D. That is quicker than this one here. Let us begin with what I call proposition D, our last proposition of simple statements which are collected for our proof. It is an application of our lemma in uh, 344 applied to uh, the evaluation of these 1 minus t operations on a full graph. It is similar to what uh, Brighton Lona Meison call lemma 5. I already wrote down a little bit on the blackboard to structure what we want to say. So we fix one graph in our forest, H is one subgraph, not equal to the full graph, but somewhere in the middle. And then again, we imagine that we have treated already some factors in the process of our renormalization. So one minus TH1 up to one minus TH I minus one that has been dealt with. And now we want to do the next step and the next step is our graph H or HI that should be treated. So the question is, what do we have to do next and what is the graph structure of what we have to do next? Okay. So uh, the next step is, uh, first of all, we have to um, do, um, okay, let me invent a notation. So what we have already done is Rx prime of g, that means uh, X prime was this set of graphs which are already treated. So the set of graphs H1 up to HI minus one, they have been treated and that defines a partially renormalized graph in our specific sector, Rx prime of G. Now the next step would be one minus TH applied onto that. Now we want to uh, investigate the structure a little bit more closely and in order to do that, we need to uh, see and remember that these graphs which are treated before, they fall into two groups, disjoint and nested graphs. Some graphs are disjoint from H and they can be completely treated independently of H itself. Some other graphs are nested inside of H and therefore they have an interference with our subtraction of H. So let us denote this explicitly. So we can, uh, the factors which uh, are disjoint from H, they anyway commute with all the subtractions uh, which are not disjoint. Therefore we can uh, bring these factors into a different order without changing it. And let's say we have here H double prime, which are the disjoint graphs. And the corresponding set was called X prime H strike through and then we multiply all these th double primes. The order between them does matter. Uh, so the order here is fixed, but all of them can be commuted with uh, the ones which I now call h prime, which are in the set x prime h. These are the subgraphs of our selected graph h. So one minus th prime acting on g. So this is the structure that we have done. So we have treated some disjoint graphs which are actually not very relevant for discussing the next graph H and we have treated those graphs. And remember these graphs here, they are precisely all subgraphs of H which are in our forest. They have all been treated, okay? So now that means what is actually uh, the evaluation of that? we know very precisely what it means to apply TH onto a sub-renormalized expression and we have done this at the beginning of our lecture today. So this T operation, T sub H, acting on Rx prime of G, what it really is, is the following. So T of H commutes with all of these disjoint graphs so we can factor this out, H double prime, these are all the disjoint graphs. They are disjoint from those and also disjoint from H. Then comes our T sub H and then the product of the nested graph. So these are all the subgraphs of H 
1 minus th prime acting on g. And now the definition of this t sub h operation is very clear and it's very uniquely defined. So pi h double prime, that just remains. And then this is defined as follows. g, the big graph, divided by h, so h is shrunk to a point and replaced essentially by a counter term. And the counter term is this t, divergent part of what? Divergent part of h, and now onto h we apply all these sub-renormalizations. h prime, 1 minus t h prime acting on h, okay? So what we have here in the brackets is the following operation. You take the subgraph H and you fully renormalize it. You do all the subtractions with respect to all subgraphs H prime of H. This is the complete set. Therefore, what we have here is the complete subrenormalization of H, and then we take the divergent part thereof. And that is what we have discussed in the beginning today. So this actually can also be written as T of R bar of H specific to our sector. Fully subrenormalized expression and then the divergent part and then this is inserted as a vertex into G over H and then we apply all the other subtractions to some disjoint graphs. And this acts only on this uh, reduced graph G over H and it doesn't interfere with this counter term. Essentially these are some other graphs somewhere else in the graph. This is the structure. And so we can do this for the example of this H3 in this big sixth loop graph. I omitted the last sixth line. Let us just look at this substructure. Then the order was uh, like this. This is a good order for this example. First H1, this is disjoint. Then H2, which is this one loop graph. And then H3. So what happens if we choose H3 is now our example graph H? So we have done H1 and H2, and now we do H3. That means for the treatment of H3, it is very relevant that we have already done the sub-renormalization of it, and this corresponds to this expression here. But it's basically irrelevant whether we have already renormalized this or not. So this can be treated outside. Nevertheless, in our expression, this disjoint renormalization appears and therefore uh, we need to take it into account and so this example should now illustrate what happens in such a case. Okay, so let us write down the graphs um, which appear now at the next step. The next step has two elements, namely it has uh, just uh, the thing itself, Rx prime of g times 1 and then the renormalization of it, t of it. Okay, so these are two things. Let me write down the graphs for that. This is just what we have done before, let's say. And then this is our next step. What are the graphs specific for this example here? If we treat H3, so or if we have treated everything before H3 here, then we have done the following. We have first written down the full graph without renormalization. Let me, let me tell you exactly what uh, I mean. So this Rx prime in the example, in the example this Rx prime of G is the following. 1 minus T H1 times 1 minus T H2 acting on G. And uh, these are two disjoint subgraphs, therefore the order doesn't matter. And I just wrote it in one arbitrary order. Anyway, this is what we have done before, and so this corresponds to four Feynman graphs, namely to the full graph, then to the graph where we take H2 and replace it by a counter term. H2 is replaced by a counter term, but H1 remains. Then we have one term where H1 is replaced by a counter term, but H2 remains. And then we have a term where both are replaced by counter terms. So four graphs, our sub-renormalized expression corresponds to four Feynman graphs which we have calculated. That is what we have already done. 
So the next step needs this minus T applied onto everything. And T applied onto everything is now this one here. So we take G divided by our graph H, G divided by our graph H, and then we insert into it the full renormalization of H. So let us first denote this full renormalization of H. This gives a counter term. Let me draw this counter term as a big X or circle with an X. This is our counter term. And this is now the divergent part of the following, namely 1 minus T on H. And in our case, this is H3. So it's the two loop graph. And this is H2, the one loop subgraph. So we have here our two loop graph plus its counter term graph this one. This is the precise expression for this bracket here in our example. And this gets now inserted into G over H onto which we act with this where that is now H1 only. So that is the following. So we have graphs G over H. G over H first without renormalization. So we shrink that two loop graph to a point and what remains is such a graph. This is G over H, where this is given by that. And now we have G over H and apply onto it the subtraction for H1, which is this. That. So we have two graphs, two graphs corresponding to uh, this applied onto G over H and two graphs for T of the sub-renormalized H. Okay, so you see now here a one-to-one -one structure of the next step. In the next step, we have to add all the Feynman graphs from before with sub-counter terms. And now we generate um, via renormalization a structure of graphs with insertions. But if you multiply the insertions with those two graphs, then you get four graphs. And each of them precisely corresponds to one of the graphs on the left-hand side. That is exactly the structure. Now, for the first line, you hopefully remember our lemma, because what we have here is essentially a case of our lemma where we have here a full graph, and here we have a reduced graph with an insertion of a subgraph. And that was the case of our lemma where we had a relationship between derivatives with respect to t and u variables of a full graph, and we could relate this to insertions of derivatives of the subgraph into the reduced graph. So the lemma covers um, the first line, but actually what I want to say now is the lemma covers all these cases because the lemma just deals with any graph and any subgraph. The graph may be a counterterm graph because a counterterm graph is nothing but a normal graph where we just happen to have a special vertex with uh, special insertions maybe uh, with some UH operation, which is, however, nothing but derivatives with respect to the U variables. And that is uh, nothing which cannot anyway happen in any graph. Therefore, such graphs um, uh, can be treated by our lemma. And let me now summarize what the lemma tells us about the sum of all such graphs. So the left-hand side of these graphs here uh, is a sum of various graphs. Let me call them G tilde, and G tilde can be either of these graphs on the left-hand side. So it's G uh, or G reduced by whatever various possibilities of graphs, also with some insertions. But insertions are nothing special. They are just uh, yet another kind of vertices. That is OK. So that means in each case, the lemma applies. And by lemma, I mean the lemma from our section 344d, which is the most powerful lemma with uh, derivatives with respect to all variables. It applies in each case. 
And the lemma always refers to a graph and a certain subgraph. And so here in each case, we need to uh, take a particular graph or a reduced graph. And then the subgraph would also be maybe this graph or that graph with appropriate h tilde, which is equal either to the normal h or h reduced by whatever. Here there is one possibility, but in general, there would be many possibilities. Now, let me remind you of the lemma itself and bring it into an optimized form. So the lemma, first of all, deals with the following quantity d by dth to some power omega h, then a derivative operator zh of minus i duh acting onto the full graph expression, namely a semantic polynomial d tilde g to the power d over 2 e to the i w g. And the lemma tells us that this is equal to an insertion uh of the following. Let me write something here. d by d t h to the power omega h times the same differential operator minus i d u h and uh, acting on e to the i w g. And now, um, okay, let me go on first. d tilde g minus d over 2 times e to the i w g. And now in the formulation of our lemma last time, we had here an explicit evaluation of the product rule according to some binomial sum. And all of that can be simplified by not evaluating the product rule, but by multiplying here with the inverse e to the minus, and uh, sorry, I made a mistake here, it's w h, and here it's minus w h. So this just cancels the remaining e to the i w h, which did not appear in our lemma. So this is a simpler formulation of the same expression as what we had last time. Okay, and here this gives an insertion of subgraph quantities inserted into the full graph. Right, and now this is what applies not only to any graph, but also to reduced graphs. And so this uh, would also apply if you replace the graph by some g tilde uh, in, in this way because it applies to anything. But now, let me make some more comments. First of all, the lemma can be massaged a little bit. We have found that the u tilde variables are useful, and u tilde is u divided by t. So if we are allowed to take arbitrary derivatives with respect to u's and t's, then of course we are also allowed to take arbitrary derivatives with respect to u tilde and t because that uh, by applying product and chain rule is the same thing. So therefore, this is of course still true if we have here u tilde. Then we can uh, look at this expression here. Um, what appears in our lemma and what you see from going through the proof, this wh is obtained from the full wg by a projection operator. We go to a specific subspace. But that means all the t variables which appear here, they get inherited into there. And uh, so that means here the subgraph h always appears with its variable th, but th is always accompanied by this extra t variables which are summarized in psi h. So this wh always contains this combination. So this is not the same thing as what you would obtain if you treated the graph h in isolation, because then just th would appear. So the difference between this and isolation is the extra factor here. So the extra factor appears here uniformly, but not here. Therefore, we can make it uniform in this new variable by uh, replacing this as psi h to the appropriate power, omega h times the derivative with respect to the product to this power, because any, anywhere else only the product appears. And then this prefactor can be factored out of the u because it's just a prefactor. So therefore, we can say uh, 
what appears here is given by psi h to the power omega h times u h of uh, the object where uniformly only this combination appears. But then uh, this is the same as what we would have in isolation up to the uniform replacement th going to th times psi h. So you may evaluate the content of the bracket here in isolation. That is nice to know, but afterwards you should apply this replacement rule. So it, uh, the lemma holds for g and g tilde and for h and h tilde. We have already said that. And at t h equals zero, uh, this is a special point of special interest. We get particular simplifications. Uh, the simplification is d tilde g factorizes into the subgraph and the reduced graph. d tilde g over h times d tilde h. And our w g does not factorize, but it splits into a sum. And it becomes precisely equal to just the w for the reduced graph uh, with nothing else. And the subgraph w just goes to 0. So it's a dramatic simplification. And of course, th equals 0 is interesting because when we evaluate divergences, we need to do it by taking derivatives with respect to t and then do t equals 0. So if we imagine that, then we get many simplifications. First of all, this factor here doesn't matter anymore because wh will be 0, so this is just 1. This is also 1 in the end, but we take derivatives, so we have to keep it for the time being and evaluate the derivatives. Then uh, this becomes a product, subgraph and reduced graph, and the subgraph part we can plug into here because uh, that is not affected by the derivative. And um, so let's maybe say this. This is independent of th by construction. Therefore, if we put it inside of the bracket, then it doesn't interfere with the derivatives. And then what remains outside are just reduced graph expressions. Therefore, we arrive at the following result. So d by dth to the power double uh, omega h and some differential operator of u tilde h variables applied onto the graph. And corresponding counter terms. Let me just write in quotation marks as counter terms. And I precisely mean the counter terms which are generated by this previous subrenormalization, as in our example. So here I mean all the semantic expressions for all the four graphs here on the left hand side. Uh, this is equal to on the right hand side at t h equals zero on the right hand side psi h to the power omega h and then the insertion u h of the following. Now we have uh, the simplified expression just d by d t h to this same power, differential operator, c h minus d u tilde h times e to the i w h times, we could factor that in, as I said, d h tilde to the power minus d over 2. And now we can say um, it happens for the full graph and also for the counter term graphs with appropriate insertion. So here we also get plus the appropriate counter terms, like that corresponds to this sum here. And this insertion then acts onto d of the reduced graph, d tilde g over h to this power times e to the i w g over h, again, plus the appropriate counter terms. And that would correspond to this sum here. 
that is the structure. Not only the structure, this is the precise expression. This is the form of the lemma that we can use in the proof because it allows us, if we have done renormalization up to a certain point, we can do the next step and apply the lemma to all of the results uh, for the full graph and the counterterm graphs we, which we have constructed previously. That is very nice and um, important for us. Yeah, and with this proposition, we have finished our set of propositions. Uh, we have collected a few properties, a quite lengthy collection, but on the other hand, most of the properties, well, probably all of the properties that we have collected today, are kind of obvious. They are in line with our previous example calculations and uh, in line with our general um, constructions but we have brought all of them into a form which can then be directly applied to um, give a full proof of renormalization. So this is then the next step, but here we have reached the end of our section 3.5 on the setup of the proof for renormalization in dimensional regularization.